this is illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read some stuff. I watched a movie. This week we're doing Gretel and Hansel, Hansel and Gretel. This is a huge episode. We actually have the director of the film, uh, Gretel and Hansel. Oz Perkins did a makeshift interview with us over email. So we have, we've asked him a few questions about this piece, and we'll be uh, sprinkling that through the episode today. We're very, very excited. Uh, Oz Perkins, if you want to hear straight to the episode, straight from the creator's mouth, what it's about, what he's trying to get across. We got it. Out today, Gretel Hansel in theaters everywhere. To start us off, we're diving deep right now <laughs> into the OG fairy tale yes. by the Brothers Grimm. The Grimm Brothers. Mm. Hansel and Gretel was originally heard from, and we'll explain why they were hearing these stories from random people, Wilhelm, is Jacob and Wilhelm, or Jakob, but I'm going to use Jacob, <laughs> and Wilhelm, his future wife and their nursery maid told him this tale. So this is where they got it from. Oh. Some random people in town. Oh, and they, oh, okay. Oh, so. And we'll explain why that is. The book is called, in German, I'll say it in English, <laughs> Children's and Household Tales, and this came out in 1812. Oh, wow. Okay. That's when the original printed version came out. There have been 17 publications of different versions of this, short versions, long versions, ones with less or more stories, adapted in different ways. Uh, right off the bat, I'm I've seen seen the having seen the film. This story is so it's rife for the picking right here to, mm -hmm. to recontextualize it and ac actually say something yeah. really meaningful about those type of dynamics. I mean, and the, the, yeah, the Grimm brothers and fa familial mm -hmm. uh, par parental, all that type of stuff. The Grimm brothers are not the first people to do a story like this. Like I said, they're cobbling together stories from folks and myths and whatnot. And so this resembles the first half of Charles Perrault's Hop on My Thumb, which was in 1697, and Finette Cendron, which is French, which I'm saying that wrong, but that's in 1721. <laughs> in both of those tales, abandoned children find their way home by following a trail. Mm. Um, they, they have taken a lot of stories, like I said, from myth and legend, so a lot of the elements are similar, but... Now, I was um, curious about that. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is kind of, I guess, uh, something I'm just assumed to a degree, but that these are age old. I mean, nobody, yeah. they, nobody can quite pin down exactly though you know, like we're, go we're going past Gretel and Hansel with the titles that you've met mentioned yeah. here but that's just the ideas of children on their own following the breadcrumbs home yeah. that type of fear so I've always wondered of just like is it really that the case that it's been just kind of retold and passed around and then it wound up in the book and now from you know that exactly. publication that's where it stayed yeah so this guy that I mentioned before Charles Perrault was a French writer in the late 1600s which is almost 200 years before this time Good Lord. Um, he laid the foundation for the fairy tale. He's the original guy that came out with this little book that had, I think, eight or nine different stories, including Little Red Riding Hood, Puss in Boots, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty. He put on the cover of that, Tales of Mother Goose. So he's the original guy. But again, his stuff was even, these are just old tales and fables that everybody knows mm -hmm. from European history that have been told to kids and whatnot. But he gave them literary legitimacy in the late uh -huh. 1600s. So some of their stories are similar or based on his kind of thing, but hardly any of theirs would be considered original by our standards. I see. So in their version, one thing that's interesting that I know the movie plays with is the idea of mothers and motherhood. And that's the whole premise of them leaving is because their parents are like, hey, we can't afford to feed you. You have to go out on your own. In the original story, the dad is kind of a lump on a log and the mom is like, look, we got to get rid of the kids. We won't be able to eat. And the dad becomes uh -huh. more sympathetic and the mom is more evil. So interestingly, in the original version of the German word is like mother or woman, but by the seventh edition that came out in 1857, the wife is now the stepmother. Oh, really? Yeah, to give her a little bit more evil. And now that's where we have the trope of like the wicked stepmother and the oh, evil stepmother. Man. That's the beginnings of all of that. Oh, yeah. wow. How yeah. interesting. But in the original one, it was just the woman or the mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then over time, people didn't like that as much. Morphed and I mean, and the dad became more I mean, you say different things when you shift that kind of identity. It was like, well, is it actually, you know, inherent to me as a living being, uh, breathing biological being, or is it is that an outsider, in, right. you know, entering the context that's sh that's shifting it? And in the original story, the kids end up getting back to the house after destroying the witch, 
and the dad is there waiting for them and the mother has died through some uh, circumstances which are not known. Oh, and so some commentators and people that study literature and whatnot believe that the fact that symbolically they killed the witch and the mother dies when they get back shows that they're metaphorically the same thing. Like the witch was an allegory for the mom. Very interesting. So yeah. for Gretel and Hansel, they're sent off at the beginning. Uh, the father is is non-existent and the mother threatens them when the first word doesn't get through. She threatens them to leave immediately yeah. um, with violence. All skip all the way to the end of the film. The two siblings are going their own way. The little boy Hansel goes back to the house but the mom is not there. But he right. reclaims the axe that she threatened them with. So that's really interesting. They never say explicitly what right. happened, what's going on. Same, they never yeah. say what happened, but she is gone. I don't know if that's, a, that, perhaps that is intentional. That's really yeah. cool. The other thing that is similar, which people may not be aware of, is the fact the reason, according to the director that Oz, that the title is switched is because it is more about Gretel yes. saving Hansel. <laughs> and that is true to the original story. So Gretel, is being the main character of this, we, um, he alludes to this, perhaps, that she is sensitive in some way or will be uh, through a, uh, and this is what he says, he gave Gretel a, a certain heightened awareness, a sixth sense, a dream life, quote, of a fluttering third eye, which I like very much, so that through her eyes and her experience, the audience is also made to feel alert and tense and potentially armed for what's coming. So you get some premonitions almost from Gre from Gretel about what's going on. She's trying to kind of put together the oddness mm -hmm. as even as they're just starting out through the woods and come across the house and come across, okay, there's this lady and there's endless food, but like, where's she making it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she's uh, much smarter and we're seeing it through mm -hmm. her eyes. Yeah, yeah, and so we get to go into Gretel's head a little bit. We get to get a taste of, of the dread that's coming and alluding to the Gretel, her it, special it, power, exactly, yeah. you know, what she is going to be attaining or maybe what she's already started to attain unbeknownst to herself. Mm -hmm. In the Grimm's book, the original 1812 thing, there are three other stories. One of them is called the Twelve Brothers. There's one called the Seven Ravens and there's one called the Six Swans. Those three also feature a woman rescuing her brother. Oh, According to scholars, for the time and place in which this was written, many men were drafted by kings to be soldiers or mercenaries or taken away from home. And so perhaps they're thinking these are fables and stories because there was a desire. For, most of the time, they were nurses and maids and like women telling uh -huh, these uh -huh. stories to their kids. And it was a desire for the return of their brothers so they wouldn't be the ones in control of the household because all of the guys were yeah. gone. The problem with that is that other stories in other cultures have similar stories, but they don't have that lineage of kings taking the brothers away to be mercenaries. Right. But it okay. still is interesting that that is a big part of their stories that they chose to put together. How fascinating. Because mm -hmm. in my mind, I go, well, they've always been, they've been equal. Just in the, the tellings of it that I am privy to that I remember. And I'm yeah. obviously, you know, I'm not, I haven't delved into the, you know, <laughs> I, I don't remember the last time I saw a Gretel, Hans, a Hansel Gretel piece of material, yeah. actually. So in my mind, they're always equally uh, vulnerable. Yeah. So speaking of the vulnerable element of the kids, before we get into how the Brothers Grimm's life mirrors a lot of the stories and the, and the history of the time, we have to go back to why the original story deals with kids needing food, parents sending their kids away, which is being right. cannibalistic. The, the whole idea of, of the scarcity that, um, it almost seems odd now, but to, okay, we have to exercise the kids from the pack, you know, like the kids go and form their own thing. Now they're own, their own deal. We yeah. have to do that because resources are so scarce. It's just something that I've, is echoed through a ton of different pieces of material. So yeah. I'm actually wondering if you could shed some light on to yeah. what is the historical uh, precedent for that. There was something called the Great Famine of 1315 to 1317. And this has etched in a lot of history and stories following Seared. this throughout European history. It took so long to recover. So f just for example, in 1276, according to official records from the English royal family, which is like, these are the people that are the mm. best of the mm -hmm. best, they're living the best life you could live in 1276. This is the, the best recorded record yeah. we have. The average life expectancy was around 35 years old. Wow. So this great famine that came about in 1315, the average life expectancy dropped to 29 years oh, wow. for the royal family. And then the plague, which started around the 1340s, 
it was only 17 years old. Oh my gosh. So this is the preceding thing where it's like the semi calm before the storm. Yeah. What happened with the Great Famine starting in 1315, there was so much more rain than was normal in Europe, all throughout Europe. The winters were much colder and it just, from what I could tell, just raining wet all the time, mm -hmm. which is no good for mm -hmm. crops. So grain could not ripen in the storehouses. The straw that they were going to give to the livestock could not be cured because everything is just yeah, wet and gross. gross. So there's no food for the livestock. The meat that they do have can't be salted because salt you either have to mine or get from the ocean or have a brine and then let the water evaporate. Right. But because it's raining so much, they can't let the water evaporate. So it's hard to even salt the meats that they do oh have. My gosh. This went on for two years, this yeah. terrible, not raining every day, but it was just like so much worse than anything they'd ever experienced yeah. in Unworkable this time conditions. It's yeah. Just, there's no, there's no gain to be met. <laughs> yeah. In this time, 10 to 25% of the populace died. Oh my God. And so the problem with this is within the plague, you know, 30 to 60% of the population died, but that was just in the span of like a few months. Like right. it just destroyed everyone. This was two years. Oh my God. Of slowly people are not finding food or just being starving able to, to eat. Yeah. yeah. And so that's where we get these stories of, oh, maybe we have to send the kids away. Maybe we have to eat them. Maybe we have, you know, these are all right. the myths circulating. I mean, yeah, those are, that would emerge as the major fears. I mean, honestly. I but mean, it's huge. That's, 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 that is quite horrifying, actually, when you think about why, how it got instilled into how many different pieces of media uh, yeah. and, and in stories, just anything at all. I mean, and the more I think about this is echoed through so much. It harkens back to something quite, 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 quite dark that, I, that we're still writing about. <laughs> right. <laughs> The thing that I found, because I tried to look into it a little bit more in terms of the cause of this, because now we know there is record mm. across the globe around this time, 1315, there is a volcano in New Zealand called Mount Tarawera, mm. which erupted, creating those natural right. conditions oh, of yeah. rain way over in Europe. How fascinating. And so they would never have yeah, known they were that. Known, they would have no idea. Oh, that's really, that's really crazy. Yeah. That's really interesting. But now we know because we know history across the world. Now we know how everything works. <laughs> so this brings us to Oz. If you don't know Oz Perkins, he is the director of Gretel and Hansel. Um, he has a couple other movies out. One is on Netflix now. I am the pretty thing that lives in the house. That one's available on Netflix. He has another one uh, called The Black Coat's Daughter. They're both horror movies, slower horror, horror movies, and that is very much of his style. So Knowing his uh, approach, uh, things that he uh, is, is drawn to, uh, we asked him creatively what he leaned into and what he steered away from in terms of the original fairy tale. He said, and quote, it was useful to lean into the fact that everyone knows the story, that everyone shares a collective dread about what they know is going to happen. Obviously a reference to death. And then he <laughs> said, quote, so it became less about what's going to happen and more about how is this going to go down, which permitted us the opportunity for a fresh design, updated characterizations, and an overall more modern feel, which is interesting because the story, as he puts it, is kind of out of time and place. Right, right, right. He goes on to say, um, in the case of Hansel and Gretel, my approach started with abandoning any sense of place and time, any historical context at all, and from there creating a world that was only our own with combinations of things not often or ever seen before. So he's talking about just like not, it's so interesting because the, the, the film, I actually think when you're not thinking about it, does an incredible job with the period. I mean, it's so evocative. Uh, it's so rich and far as far, it's, it's just textured all the way through. And it's so full of character in the frame that you're not really thinking exactly about what time it is because it's kind of screaming at you connotatively like lulling that part of your brain to sleep is like this yeah. is old this is an old tale don't <laughs> worry about it which yeah. actually i think it makes it stand out more and more and more because i think about the design elements in the film and what he says here about things not often or ever seen before i can't tell what they have used out of history and just out of you know history. they shot in ireland they shot in really old locations it's like i can't tell what was there what was but you don't have to know about the salem witches what, or you right. don't have to know about the great famine of but 1315 I, as far as the period it's like I, he's not there's nothing saying this is what time it is and i can't tell what they have created out of thin air mm -hmm. totally original for the film and what they just stumbled upon and shot that was just real which i think it, it really creates a magicism to this that's very hard. It's own world. It's a, a very strange type of world building that yeah. they've done here, which I really appreciate. 
alongside him having to pull from unknown elements or different elements entirely, we're always fascinated by if there is a personal attachment to the thing as well, because he got the script. We keep seeing from that time else. and time again through through this show of just seeing what artists take from material, whether it's theirs or not, what they put into material and what comes out the other side. Yeah. Uh, it's really fascinating. So that's something that we asked him about. And he said, quote, yes, for me, it's all about the tug of war between wanting and needing to be attached to people, places and things and wanting to be completely alone. <laughs> It's the human condition, or one of our conditions anyway, that we tend to cling to the world and everything in it, when all the time we also know we had better be practicing letting it all go. I love that. Yeah. So it's very much at the at the center of this film, and it's very much a, it's such a childlike way to look at the world. We think as we move through the world, we're collecting, mm -hmm. you know, and we're holding on. But as we grow up and we really go through adolescence, we come into adulthood, we realize that things don't really stick around always. Sometimes yeah. they do, but sometimes they don't. And you can't tell what those elements are going to be. And you have to be willing to move on with it or move on without it. And it's interesting because I looked into the Brothers Grimm and whether or not they think they were just cobbling together old fairy tales and oh, yeah, stories, yeah. their life mirrors a lot specifically of what goes on with Hansel and Gretel mm. um, in terms of siblings in as well. Ooh, sib ooh, I'm interested It's not now. just the Grimm. It's not just tea. Yeah, It's the Brothers Grimm. They were born a year apart, 1785 and 1786. Their dad was a lawyer and then a magistrate. They had a huge, large house, a cozy life. He died in 1796. Jacob was 11 years old at the time. He's the older brother. Oh, okay. He is what I guess would call the Gretel of uh -huh. this scenario. Okay, so he has, he, to, he has to grow up real fast. Yeah, he is also known for being much more introspective, and Wilhelm was very outgoing, although the paradox is that Wilhelm has ailments and illnesses and is pretty sick his whole life. So Jacob is now the head of the household, mm -hmm. and he has to take care of them. They had other brothers and sisters beneath them, but they have now lived in poverty with their mom, they both attend the University of Marburg, which they are trod upon for their lower class standing because they've been living in poverty now for years and years. Jacob was still financially responsible for his mother, his brother, oh and gosh, his younger yeah. siblings at this time. So in 1805, he accepts a post in Paris as a research assistant to this guy, von Savigny, who is a really hmm. good professor and ends up teaching him about classics and German history and literature and oh, linguistics yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And that's where he takes off. His brother follows him into, like I said, the university there. Their mother dies in 1808, so now he becomes fully responsible, Jacob does, for all of his uh -huh. younger siblings. He arranges and gets paid for his brother Ludwig to study art at an art school and Wilhelm to extend his visit to seek treatment for his heart and respiratory ailments in another city. And then he oh follows gosh, yeah. him and joins him as a librarian. So he is like suddenly thrust upon yeah it's on him it's all this responsibility. responsibility i love that the angle that the new film has taken i mean really taking gretel and putting her in a dominant role over the young uh, brother mm -hmm. um there's so much to pick apart there growing up too fast having to be responsible for things that should not be your responsibility but they are and they're in, related to you and so you want to it's a it's a massive tug of war there so it's really fascinating that the siblings and especially him that was was thrust into a very similar situation of actually having to be responsible, having to look after a, a family now as a as yeah. a thirteen year old. <laughs> like what in the world? Yeah. Like even Gretel, I think, is older than thirteen yeah, in this yeah. movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. They write this book, Children's and Household Tales, in eighteen twelve. Well, I heard this one. Put it in. <laughs> <laughs> they they started cobbling together all these different stories. Rumpelstiltskin, The Fog Prince, Snow White, Rapunzel, Sleeping Beauty. It's the greatest all, hits, baby. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, going further through into their life in 1825, Wilhelm, the younger son, marries. Jacob stays with them. They all live together. He never marries, Wait. though. And they both become professors at a university. But interesting how the younger son moves on with his life has a wife, has kids, yeah. Jacob still is stuck with trying to, maybe he feels like he has to keep pulling the pieces together. How interesting, together. yeah, that he, that, oh, wow. In 18, I mean, yeah. interesting, they all live together, too, even after that. Like, his younger brother, like, in a way, surpasses him, but then they're still, like, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily drive a wedge between them. Right. But, uh, but you would have to think that certainly... Uh, Jacob would be thinking about that. They stick together, like I said. It's, yeah. Jacob is still the one leading the charge in terms of, he's like the main guy for them 
1838, they start to say, well, we got to make a name for ourselves again. So they're trying to write this definitive dictionary of German words and linguistics and the history of the German language. And most of what they end up writing together from here on out is stuff about language and phonology and the history of the linguistics of Germany. Looking at it from a second perspective, like we said, these weren't stories for kids. And most of their work, like I said, was this massive historical German dictionary. And they only got as far as the word fruit, frucht, in (laughs) German. Like, this thing was not finished until 1961. Really? Because each word is they're going through all the lineage of how it was came to be into the German language. Oh, wow. That's what Jacob is most known for. Wilhelm is known for the storytelling, jovial, natured kind of stuff. Fascinating. There is a law of linguistics called Grimm's Law of Linguistics. Like I said, I didn't realize how much they were more so, instead of trying to just write fun stories for kids, Mm -hmm. they were trying to, in a larger sense, unify Germany and their idea of what Germany was through stories and language. At this time, Germany was just a bunch of principalities and random nation states, and and everybody was reading French fairy tales and English fairy Ah, tales. And so they were saying, no, 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 this is German heritage and culture from German people. And then same thing with understanding the language. So the Grimm's Law, there's two things that you have to know about called stops and fricatives. So stops (laughs) is like P-T-K. They're like hard stops that you use, like tuk, yeah, you know, yeah, okay. that kind of thing. And then fricatives are involved with friction. So like F and TH, f, f, yeah, and they don't yeah. have anything to do with your vocal cords. So in Latin terms, like the word pater, that first letter is a stop. It's a P. In Spanish, which is descending from the Latin, it, it becomes padre. It stays with that hard sound. Mm. But in the Germanic languages, like English and German, it becomes a fricative. So it's father instead of P. And in German, it's Vater, uh-huh. which is a V, which is another fricative, uh-huh. uh, one of those things. And same thing with like tres, which is three in English and German. Uh-huh. It's got a th, it's got that friction sound instead of the stop sound. Okay. Cornu is cornucopia, which means horn in English. So again, a hard sound becomes a soft h sound in the Germanic languages. So he his law is saying like the Germanic and the Latin stemmed from the same one. Right. And we can tell because everything that was a hard stop then became a fricative. Uh-huh. And so that's also showing like German is not some random cobbled together thing. Like we're no, all it's coming from the, linked. Yeah. yeah. It's not a it's not a lesser cultural thing because everybody is looking to like Latin and Greek and the it has Romans laws like and, math look like they move this way with the language. So this this is the result of it. It's directly linked. Yeah. <laughs> in every example throughout the alphabet. <laughs> yeah. And that's more so also what he was trying to show with the fairy tales is no, no, no. These are all coming from the same thing. Yeah. We're okay. just as valuable in society. Wow. Happening in 1812? Yeah, that's when the book first came out. Historically, what is odd about this and unfortunate is during the 1930s and 40s, these tales were used by propaganda by the Third Reich, by Adolf Hitler. (laughs) Oh, my God. The wrong sense of proud to be German. Uh... Although there are a few stories that are somewhat anti-Semitic in nature in the original stories. But- Hitler just completely changed Little Red Riding Hood and made it a Jewish wolf. Oh and Cinderella God. was about Aryan purity. What a just, reach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when the Allies occupied Germany after World War II, they banned this book for a period of time. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, because it was being used as propaganda. It's too good. It's too, it's, it's too, it's too much culture, people. This is... <laughs> oh, they don't need that. They'll get ideas. Yeah. This isn't about kids. This is about German unity. So with all of that, ultimately, we know that the Grimm brothers were trying for an understanding of Germany as a populace and a people and a unifying of the country. They're in an identity crisis. Right. This wasn't about kids. Right. But Oz was saying in a question that we asked him about his thing, was there anything that you wanted to get across? And his answer is more directly related to kids and young people. He said, my only real wishes for the movie is that younger audiences go and look and maybe end up with a feeling like they challenge themselves a little, challenge themselves to be patient and brave. If younger audiences can come out of the theater feeling reassured and in touch with some sense of their own developing strength, then I think we did okay. 
that's the message at the heart of the yeah. film really is, you know, find your own way. If this can offer anything, if it's any stability at all, any kind of reassurance that like, hey, it's going to you're going to figure this out. Things are going to be strange. You're going to feel off kilter. You're going to feel wrong, but yeah. it's going to be OK. Um, it was really incredible to have mm-hmm. the filmmaker say that. It's like, really, I would love young audiences to come away feeling a little bit empowered, a little bit more confident of where they stand in the world and who they are going to grow up to be. Yeah, um, that's a re- that's a really fascinating thing to have at the center of Hansel and Gretel, Gretel and Hansel. And um, even though the, the Grimm brothers, even though it was called Children's Tales, like it wasn't designed for kids. You can only imagine that their influence in the stories that they picked, like we said, a lot of them revolve around sisters saving their younger brother. Right. Yeah. Um, some critics oh, strange. might. Yeah. That's so strange because that's 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 so much of the reason I think that why this particular film got made is because of the take it actually takes with that. Uh, yeah. That dynamic of making her older, making the, the brother younger and exploring that. I mean, and that's so that's uh, thematically really hot right now. It's yeah. just Yeah. Let's let's pick that apart. Let's see what that's like. Um, so it's really fascinating because that that seemed to be the fresh element here. They're being like, oh, they're flipping the script here. Cool. Let's, let's see what that. Well, actually, they this is kind of inherent to the material dating way back, if you really look at it. That's really fascinating to me. Of, yeah, of the 200 tales that exist in the largest versions of the, the book that they had created, 41 of them are about siblings, which are probably wow. representative of their experience. And many of the stories follow the similar trajectory, which is where the characters lose a home which they did, mm. work industriously at a specific task, which they did, <laughs> and in the end, find a new home, which they also did. Something that just keeps standing out to me, I mean, about the film mm-hmm. um, is, I mean, and, and speaking with Oz about what the the major themes here are, but I just, I really appreciate, just, he, he wrote something here that I keep thinking about, and, and he, he, <laughs> he prefaces it, it's like, hopefully this isn't too grim, but that the witch in the film is really, is standing in for the reality of death, the inevitability of death. And the, met- the message she carries is something like, we go into whatever is next alone. So there's no time like the present to be preparing for that. Right. And so if you look at it as like, well, okay, the witch is saying break free and and fully ascend at the expense of, of somebody else, at the expense of other people. So Gretel takes that and goes, well, okay, maybe yes, but no. Maybe we should break apart. Maybe I, I should go down a this path, but maybe not your path. Maybe right. not the path you have said. Maybe there's a different way around this. Um, so at, I, I appreciate how overt this is towards the end of this film. Um, and especially after talking with him, it's like, oh, yes, that's it's so very, very clear uh, as to what they're trying to say. And I love the idea of going to an antagonist. Yes, but no. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, I get your idea. I'm going to do that, but not in the way that you have put forth, not the way you've said. Um, there's another way around yeah. this. I don't know. I, I Also, <laughs> imagine if like the Brothers Grimm were not the Brothers Grimm. And they went their separate way. Right. And Jacob just did the linguistic stuff. And Wilhelm told stories. Or he did his own thing. And they didn't collaborate on this stuff. It's so... In- I mean, it's just it's interesting. They're trying to hold Germany together. Or trying to <laughs> redefine Germany. Yeah. When... Now in 2020, we're talking, you know, it's much more, it's a, it's an introspective look of just like, well, maybe go out on your own and, and mm-hmm. branch out and, 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 and fully flower. Um it's 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 just a testament to how versatile these this material can be um, right. if you don't pigeonhole it and say well this is a kids thing or this is just a horror movie or this is just a or oh, that's an old ta- <laughs> no 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 what's it trying yeah. to say what's it, what's really what is the conversation here and i think I'm just stoked that there's a movie like this out there that actually has something to say, actually (laughs) add to the conversation about like, well, this, okay, let's talk about some, some familial dynamics here, some sibling dynamics. Let's talk about being thrust into a piece of, you know, a responsibility role that maybe isn't all yours, but you feel obligated nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about all of that. Let's talk about being a woman in charge, Uh, you know, and I highly recommend if you're into this at all, if you're curious about what we've talked about uh, on the episode today. The, the film came out today, January uh, 31st, uh, Friday. So check it out. Go check I it think out. This is, I think this is a really, really interesting film. This is, 
and I have to say, this is something that I just don't understand why MGM has done, has put out at all, <laughs> I swear. And maybe there's more film than our audience wants to go, but I feel like this is an A24 film in a lot of ways. Mm. This is such a slow burn, rich, textured film. Yeah. I it I'm, Really, it's going wide, theatrical. MGM's putting out. Well, and give this this director, doesn't happen. Yeah, give this director some love. This is the first theatrical stuff, like you said, that a studio is taking a chance on for something very different from what most very, horror, very horror jump scare kind of things that are coming out right now. Thinking about all my preconceived notions of what this would be, then actually seeing it, now analyzing it and tearing it apart, I'm very, very excited that something like this is getting a wide release, and I really hope it does well. This is this is a really cool one. I think people are going to like it. So go check it out. Thank you for listening. We hope to do more speaking with actual creators in the future. Thank you, Oz, for being a part of it. Thank you for contributing if you're out there listening somewhere. And uh, thank you all everyone else except us for listening (laughs) (laughs) and we will catch you all on the flip flop one little final thing in terms of adapting this particular story in 1983 the disney channel of all places aired a version of this which i'll post a link to on youtube which is very bizarre aired only once on october 31st at 10 30 p.m on the Disney Channel. It was live action, all Asian actors. This person had done an apprenticeship at Disney and then it ended and started working for them and then moved on because his stuff was too dark for kids. This is the first production ever made by Tim Burton. Oh my gosh. It's only been shown at retrospectives about his life at museums in 2009, but it was found because people recorded it on VHS when it was aired. Oh my God, Um, yeah. But yeah, after this, he had also done a little short about Vincent Price that was tagged onto this, but this is his first live action thing. And you can tell (laughs) it looks a lot like Beetlejuice. It's really weird Yeah, yeah. and strange that Disney was like, yeah, you can make this. And then they were like, no, 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 actually, we don't want you to do anything else. And then he went on to be how successful he was. But the first thing he ever did- Yeah, do a children's thing. (laughs) (laughs) And now we have this story that's come out now, but the first thing he ever did was an adaptation of Hansel and Gretel. My God. No, I'm not like, Frank and Weenie was the first thing he did, right? <laughs> you know? I'm like, wow, that's that's great. That's fa- that's that's fantastic. Tim Burton. Yeah. Disney. Burying it. Burying it. <laughs> Do not let that come out. <laughs> right. But it's out there on YouTube? Yeah, I'll post a link. Oh, to man. It. Absolutely. That, that'll, be, that'll be great.